part of the research process is to review what other research has already learned about our research problem. And so this is called, this step is called the literature review, or sometimes we just say the lit review for short. And it's a really important part of the uh, research process because a lot of times, once we find out what other people have researched, we realize that we've are, either we've already got the answer to our question, or we're asking the wrong question, or we need to rephrase our question or something like that. So the literature review is an extremely important part of uh, the research process. And to, to summarize its purpose, we can say, first of all, that it it's an attempt to respond to the research question or problem by summarizing what's known about the topic. We start off with the, the research uh, uh, question. Um, let's take, for example, uh, how, let's, let's, I like cookies. Let's choose a research question on uh, who eats cookies. When are cookies eaten by different people? The literature will review would then focus on cookies and eating and the different variables that we want to look at um, uh, there. So um, the literature reviews looks at what's done in the past, but it's it should be structured in a special way. You're not going to just summarize one article after another. You want to use the literature review to lead up to your hypothesis that you want to test. You want to structure it so that um, we can go one step further than all what the literature has already found, but we can make the, the tentative conclusion that an hypothesis is true, and then you'll go out and collect data to see if it is true. So it needs to be structured to, as a logical argument leading up to your hypothesis. So here's a sample outline. The introduction would be a problem statement or the research question. You could start with a real life example. And then you get to the body of the sample outline and you would uh, start uh, um, with different concepts. So, so suppose I'm interested in how age and gender predict cookie eating. So the first concept that I might talk about is cookie eating. And I, uh, I could define what cookie eating is. Am I including cakes and sweets and all that? I'm, I can make a real clear definition of, of cookie eating. I can look at what, how other people have uh, researched uh, uh, people eating sweet, uh, sweet things, um, uh, come up with some definition. I'll look at what the research says are the antecedents. And it seems to mean what comes before eating cookies or eating sweets. What causes people? It can be like hunger would be an antecedent. Having a sweet tooth. The availability of cookies in the house. Um, uh, belief that cookies are uh, 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 a good source of nutrition. Past experiences of psychological soothing from binge eating of cookies. There's been all kinds of studies that are relevant to why people uh, uh, eat cookies. And then I can, it's also good for me to look at what are the consequences of eating lots of cookies. And there's been a lot of research on that also. So the first concept would be the cookie eating. The second concept, I'm interested in how age and gender affect cooking eating. So I could talk about age. What do we mean by age? And what do we know about uh, aging, especially aging how people uh, eat? Um, the antecedents of aging, <laughs> it's not much there. You just have to have time and staying alive. But there's lots of consequences to aging. So we would have to go into uh, um, uh, that in detail. And then maybe the third concept would be how gender affects uh, uh, cookie eating. So again, I'd have to define it. The antecedents to gender, most people would say they're primarily biological, but there's uh, also sociological factors uh, uh, involved if we're talking about gender and not just physical sex. Um, and then what are the, the, the consequences? How, what do we know how men and women are, uh, are, are, are different? What do we already know uh, that they do differently because of their uh, 
uh, gender. And what we do is we go through these articles and then we put it all together and our conclusion is how these are all how these relate to each other. What do we know about cookie eating and uh, gender? What do we know about um, uh, age and uh, cookie eating? And we put the concepts together and we say, so it appears that both age and gender uh, will predict cookie eating. And you might want to even make a directional hypothesis that uh, adults, as they get older, they'll eat fewer cookies and that men eat more cookies than women. Or you might have theoretical reasons for the uh, other directions. And you might want to just leave it as a two-tailed hypothesis. But we would come up with some type of hypothesis to test. So the, the logic kind of here is, okay, we know this, this, and this, therefore we can have confidence in our hypothesis. But for those of you that are skeptical, I'm gonna go out and collect data, and that's what the rest of the study will be about, is collecting data to, uh, to test the hypothesis to see if you were actually right, to convince the skeptics. Now, perhaps you weren't right, and then, you've have, then you're convincing yourself that Ooh, your logic wasn't uh, right in your lit review. And that, that's quite eye-opening also when you uh, uh, all these things that you assumed it to be true weren't uh, didn't play out in your study. So I've got a couple notes here. One is that the literature review is not a summary of one article after another. It's a clear argument leading to your, hypothes, your hypotheses. So it's got to be structured like an essay leading to the conclusion of your hypotheses that you're going to go test out quantitatively. Now, secondly, you need to avoid making assumptions with which your audience might not agree unless you attempt to defend them or at least clearly state what they are. For example, I teach at Azusa Pacific University. It's a Christian university, and many of the people that go there are Christians. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I had a really... Uh, awesome experience with God when I was a, a teenager. I didn't wasn't, didn't grow up as a Christian, didn't even know what a Christian was, um, but I uh, I heard the gospel. I responded to, to, uh, to Christ's call in my life, and I've been trying to live for him uh, uh, since then, and I have found that, whoa, he really has communicated to, to humans in the Bible. But I know not everybody agrees with me. Um, so I can't, when I'm doing research, I can't say, and the Bible says, and expect that to make sense to people. Um, now, if I'm writing to a Christian audience who believes the, in the authority of the Bible, that God loves us so much that he communicated to us objectively through the life of Christ and through uh, the Bible, um, but if I'm talking to a general audience, I can't just say, oh, yeah, and the Bible says something and expect people to believe that that's uh, true. They're not going to accept that as an authoritative uh, source. So I need to frame it as, well, from my perspective or from a, the perspective of a, of a Christ follower, uh, this has ethical implications and such and such. And I can explain why the biblical ideas would, would relate to me, but I can't assume that other people would uh, uh, share my views on that. So we need to be, uh, we always need to provide reasons for what we're saying unless we are sure that the audience shares our same, the same assumptions with us.